Thanks, Walter. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out this morning. And uh, thanks to the folks in the first session who I think set up an awful lot of the stuff that we are going to do in this second session. Um, so what I want to do in the little bit of time I'm going to be up here is simply set up what's going on here, more or less give you a background on why it is we care about the evaluation of climate services. And I thought I was going to have to do a harder sell, but actually the first panel seems to have completely capitulated to that point, so I, this will be much easier for me. So uh, as we heard from a number of folks in the first panel by way of a little bit of background, historically, if you look at the field of climate services, uh, the emphasis has really been on the development of climate information, which then backs into like working on climate science. There's been relatively little focus on how to communicate that information, again, across the history of this field, relatively little. Doesn't mean nothing's been done, but relatively little, and nearly nothing done in terms of actually understanding the people who we think are going to use this information. That's particularly true in the area of climate services for development if we think our end users are people like, for example, rain-fed farmers in different parts of the world. As a result, one of the things that's become clear to us, I think, in, in this field is that an awful lot of climate services work is based upon assumptions that may or may not have any grounding in empirical reality. We have a lot of assumptions about who our users are, and that ranges from sort of treating them as big lumps to breaking them into groups that we presume are meaningful subgroups, like by gender or other things. We presume an awful lot about the utility of information for people. That is to say, if we produce weather and climate information, it must be useful in some way, shape, or form. And I think you heard in that first session that there's actually some really serious problems with that assumption that people are coming to acknowledge. So by way of background, why we're all sitting up here, why actually uh, CCRD paid for an awful lot of evaluation work and, and paid so much attention to this. Back in 2011 at the first International Conference on Climate Services, uh, we had a side event called Development Day. And in the course of Development Day, a very clear message emerged from basically anyone who is going to pay for climate services. And you see sort of the list of the broad categories we're dealing with here. So development banks, development agencies, humanitarian organizations, the CG system, even national governments, all of them wanted evidence, both to justify investing in these kinds of things and to know what kinds of things to invest in. And it turned out, as they started asking for this evidence, we realized we didn't necessarily have a lot of it. This created a series, then, of major challenges for us in the area of sort of climate services for development. There are policy challenges that emerge from this. We didn't have a lot of evidence for their efficacy, for climate services' efficacy. We presumed they were effective, but we couldn't actually point to numbers or measurements that said they were effective or how they were effective, which of course makes it a harder sell to someone who then has to invest in these sorts of things. Um, as Glenn Anderson will address as we go down the line, and this speaks to why Glenn and other people's work on valuation was so important, there was very little evidence for their economic value out there. And of course, if you're gonna make an investment in something, you want to know what the return on that investment's going to be. Uh, but this also created program and project level challenges. We basically didn't really know a lot about how climate information functioned on the ground among our presumed end users. We really didn't know much about how they used them, which meant we didn't really know uh, what was and wasn't working, which means we didn't really know what to build on, what we needed to work on differently. We basically didn't know how to implement these things in a rigorous evidence-based kind of way. So basically what comes out of all of this is sort of an answer to Meredith's question toward the end of the first session. What do you do when you start finding out about what things do and don't work, et cetera? We needed an emphasis on learning. We needed to learn a lot. We needed to learn about the value of climate services. We needed to learn about their efficacy, which by the way varies really dramatically depending on the service and where you are. When they don't work or don't work the way we think, why does that happen? That's a really, really important issue and something we didn't have a lot of data on. How they work when they work. We also didn't have a lot of data on that, as it turns out. And, for that, and then the final issue, how do we even properly identify the people we think are the users here? Again, you know, we can talk about generic groups of farmers, we can talk about men and women, we can talk about rich and poor, and there's usually all kinds of different divisions that shape the way people use this information. And to bow to Glenn's continual teasing of me about the work in Mali, how do we do all of this within a reasonable time frame and budget? Uh, which we may or may not have done in my lab. But in any case, um, that, that's still, I think, a pretty serious issue here. 
Very quickly, and I think you're going to hear about this, so I'm not going into detail. I'm trying to set all this sort of stuff up. In the course of CCRD and in the course of our evaluation work, I think a lot of really important stuff has already started to come out. We have all kinds of new evidence about what kinds of evaluation methods actually work in climate services. These range from quantitative to qualitative methods. They engage everything from the economic to the social. We have new understandings of how climate services actually work for people on the ground and for end users. We have better understandings of who benefits from different kinds of climate services program programs, and that tells us a lot about how we can reach more people than we currently do with those programs. We have a lot of new evidence for the impact and efficacy of these programs. More or less, we can start to answer when are climate services appropriate development interventions, and when are they not something we should be putting our money into. So thank you all for paying attention to me, and I look forward to hearing from all my colleagues on the panel to elaborate all these points. Oh, there we go. Uh, so Walter seems to have ceded the chairing to me. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened. Um, so next up is Sheila Anzeri from the Hurdle Lab at the University of South Carolina to talk about our really expensive long assessment in Mali. <laughs> I don't know how to use this. How does this work? I'm technologically challenged, so Ed has to help me all the time to do this. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to be using the um, assessment of the Mali Agromet Advisory Program to talk about the lessons we learned uh, with regard to climate service evaluation. Um, I'm going to start with a small background of the program. Um, the program was started as an emergency measure to address food security in Mali in the late 1970s and early 1990s. It started with a pilot in 1982 with 16 farmers. Um, and then after really promising results, it was decided that it should be scaled up and it was scaled up. Um, the scale up started in 1993 and currently Mateo Mali estimates that there are about 2,000 farmers who participate in the program. The main aim of the program was to assist rural farmers to make um, informed decisions about um, agriculture and farming. Um, and there are several products that are delivered to farmers, including uh, climate, climatological crop calendars and uh, seasonal forecasts. Um, there are five crops that are covered, and these are millet, sorghum, peanuts, cotton, and maize. <clears throat> so the assessment was done in 2012. And um, at that time, there had been no independent evaluation of farm level program impact since the pilot in the early 1990s. And so the aim of the assessment in 2012 was to independently evaluate program impact on agricultural outcomes. There are two parts to the assessment. Um, there was a scientific portion, and then there was a field assessment. And my talk is basically going to be focusing on the field assessment portion. Um, and there's a report that has come out, and you can find it online. Um, so from the onset, there are some challenges. Um, because there had been no independent evaluations, uh, and, and then also because the program was started as an emergency rather than a development program, um, what happened is that there were no baselines. and. There are no baselines um, that were available for the program. And on top of this, because there had been such a, um, a long period of time between the start of the program and when um, the assessment was done in 2012, those baselines, even if they had existed, would not have been very useful. So the key lesson here for evaluation is that it's really critical to build evaluation into climate service programs at the inception, at the design phase. Otherwise, it's very difficult to attribute um, outcomes to the service that's being provided. And then it's also very difficult to actually measure any change that has occurred. <clears throat> 
So what we ended up doing was uh, designing the field assessment around a treatment and lose control um, design. And the treatment villages were those villages that were assumed to have participated in the program. And then the loose control villages were villages that were 10 to 20 kilometers away. Um, so they were fairly close to the treatment uh, villages. We ended up with 640 structured interviews and 132 focus groups. Um, we, those were collected on the basis of gender and seniority within the uh, communities that were surveyed. Um, <clears throat> and then the villages were spread across four agroecological zones. But when it came to analysis, we found that there was a third group of villages that existed, which were villages that had formerly participated in the program but were no longer participating, either because um, the mechanisms for collecting data at the village level had failed, the rain gauge was no longer working, or the farm observer had died. Um, <clears throat> and so because of that, at the analysis stage, it wasn't useful to do the, pairway, the pairwise analysis of treatment and lose control villages. And so what we ended up doing was comparing data between villages that had participated in the program and were no longer participating, those that were currently participating, and those that had never participated. <clears throat> So some of the findings that we have, um, we found that overall there's really low use of advisories. In, across most villages, it was less than 20%. We found there were highly gendered patterns to the use of advisories. Um, the women participation was very low, and often there was no participation from women at all. Um, we found that there was very little clear evidence of uh, advisory influence on crop selection. There were a subset of farmers, and these were mostly wealthy men, who followed advisories very religiously. And there was evidence among those farmers that when it came to selecting crop varieties, they did follow the advisories. And then we also found that there was a gap between uh, people who said that they were aware of the program and the percentages of people who are actually likely using um, the advisories. So <clears throat> that raised questions as to um, <laughs> how do we explain the patterns that we see? Um, and we had used the survey methodology to tell us who was using the advisories, but we couldn't answer the question of why or why not were people using the advisories. And then we also couldn't answer how climate information fits into livelihood decisions. And so the key lesson here for evaluation is that it's really critical <clears throat> in order to evaluate and adjust effectively that climate services evaluation goes beyond surveys to embrace a wide range of methodologies. And um, at Tidal, we're using a methodology um, called LIG, but there are other ways to think about this. And there are really, there are, there are a lot of tools that can be used to understand how and why um, people use climate, climate services. So <clears throat> some of the initial findings from our, um, our efforts to understand how and why this information is being used. We see that patterns of use actually reflect the farmer's ability to use rather than their actual trust in the advisories. Because we know the farmers who are using the advisories are actually using them fairly cons consistently. Um, we know that the use of uh, climate services reflects the need for climate information in people's livelihood strategies and also depends on whose livelihoods are being targeted. And the key lesson here is that in terms of scoping and assessment, um, it's really important that climate services design must elicit that small subset of decisions um, that people can make, and then um, the activities also that are affected by that information. <clears throat> and this next, uh, this next slide further talks about that. So this is a sample of our findings. Um, and we have been looking at aspects of decision making and how those aspects of decision making have an, can have an impact on advisory use. 
And so in this part of Mali, what we see is that first that junior men have to wait for senior men's decision on the start of agricultural activities um, for at the concession level. So in Mali, you have the concession level and then you have your own family plot. And for the concession level, you do have to wait for the senior man to say, we can't plant now, and this is what we need to plant. And so the, the ability of junior men to independently act on advisories, even if they're aware of advisories, even if they want to follow them, is fairly limited. The second aspect is that senior women, um, as compared to junior women, have much more autonomy over decisions related to their own fields, to their own crops, and to their own income. And so they could use advisories. But the key is that advisories do not focus on the crops that women grow. So of the five crops that are covered by the advisory, women in this area are most likely to grow peanuts, but mainly they grow rice. So the utility of advisories are very limited for them. Um, the third thing is that married women have to wait for the male head of household to make decisions on when they can use farming equipment and when they can use animals for plowing. And so because of this, even if the women could be able to use advisories, they can't respond in a timely manner because they are waiting for someone else's decision on when they can use key assets. <laughs> So the key lesson here <clears throat> is that the utility of climate services varies greatly depending on the roles and responsibilities of the user, which determine what kinds of decisions you can, you can make and how fast you're able to respond, even if you're able to respond to climate services. And some final thoughts about climate service evaluation, and we tied this uh, very explicitly to the CCRD framework. <laughs> so in terms of scope and assess, um, climate service evaluation requires a deep understanding of climate information use among end users. Uh, in terms of uh, design, climate service evaluation requires planning and incorporation at the project inception. In terms of um, assess, evaluate, and adjust, climate service evaluation requires an understanding of the differences among end users, and this is critical. And uh, in terms of evaluate and adjust, climate service evaluation requires the use of multiple methods to identify patterns of use, and then explain those patterns in an actionable manner. And um, the Mali assessment was conducted as conducted as a post hoc climate service evaluation. And <laughs> in terms of uh, post hoc evaluations, um, they can be very time consuming. Uh, they, become, they can become costly very quickly. And then at uh, the end of all of that, um, you can have indeterminate results. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I do hope that we have time because I already have so many questions. And we have so many answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next speaker. Next speaker. It'll take some time, but we have answers. Next speaker is Kathy, <laughs> Kathy Vaughan from the IRI, from International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Thanks. Thanks, Walter. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to talk about some of the work that we've done through the Climate Services Partnership uh, Evaluation Working Group. Um, I don't want to get too much into kind of the process of that group, but I, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to our case study activity, um, which actually Steve has already mentioned, but this was one of the first things that we did after the first international conference um, on climate services in 2011, we recognized that there was a great deal of information on, on kind of what was working and what wasn't in climate services within the community, but that wasn't, there wasn't necessarily a mechanism to get that knowledge out and kind of share it. So we worked together with the Global Framework for Climate Services to develop a template for case studies. We collected case studies between the two organizations. We documented over 100 individual services. Um, I think about a third of those services are available on our website. Um, we've also got a link to the GFCS if you wanted to check those out. Um, we found that the, the case studies were really useful in terms of documenting this experience and sharing knowledge. 
when we tried to look at the collection kind of as a whole in order to get a sense of, of what was good practice in climate services, we found it a little bit challenging. Um, some of the reasons for this was that all of our case studies were uh, user, were, were self-reported. And because most of them came from climate service providers themselves, we had a hard time getting kind of the user perspective in there. Of course, if you don't have the user perspective, you can't tell what's useful or what's used. Um, so we also found that um, kind of since climate services are being developed in a really kind of astounding array of different contexts, and since they all have different starting points, it was hard for us to define what success meant. Um, it was clear that what was working in one place wasn't necessarily going to work in another place. And so that concept of success, success really had to be contextualized. Um, another issue we had was that our case studies, um, in many cases, people weren't, didn't feel comfortable talking about the challenges that they had faced um, or what maybe wasn't working. And so uh, we've already actually talked about this today, but so it was, it was kind of hard to figure out what was working if you weren't getting any information about what, what didn't work or what had to be tweaked along the way. Um, so, so I, I don't want. I definitely don't want to sell these case studies short. I think there's a lot of great information in there, and I think if you're interested, I encourage you to check them out. Um, but I, I bring the, bring this up here because it also this this process I think helped us helped encourage us um, that we really needed to do more in order order to start identifying good practice in climate services. So one of the things we did um, to to do that kind of as a as a next step was. Um, was to get involved in these large-scale evaluations. One was just presented here, uh, this work in Mali. Another was done with CCAFs um, on an agromet project in India. And both of those projects uh, produce a lot of kind of information, especially about the varied impacts of climate services. As you may have gathered um, from the last couple comments, they, they were not easily replicable, those um, those evaluations, and we couldn't assume as the Climate Services Partnership that everyone kind of in our membership could engage in that kind of a large-scale activity. So we, we set upon this idea of what we called a mid-level evaluation. Um, the idea here was that we could try to gather information, useful information, about how climate ser services were working and what the benefits were without, well, at a relatively kind of modest <laughs> investment. Um, so the process we, we used to develop this was collaborative. We had a meeting in New York where we invited a range of experts on climate um, services and evaluation. We developed a protocol uh, that could be used to gather these mid-level evaluations. And we sent, out, um, we sent out independent evaluators to use that protocol in, in different contexts. We got four um, of those evaluations back, and they're also on our website uh, if you wanted to check them out. Um, and then. We also collected feedback from those evaluators on the process of using the protocol and their process of evaluation. And um, to be totally honest, the feedback wasn't entirely positive about our, our, um, our protocol. What we found was that we, had, we were very conscious that climate services were, could, were being uh, developed in many contexts, and evaluation itself could mean many different things. So we kind of tried to, to develop general guidelines that evaluators could use. Um, but what we found was that many evaluators found that confusing or, and that it didn't go, kind of go far enough in giving them information on what they really needed to be look at, looking at. So, so we're still kind of getting, trying to get that level of information right without over-prescribing, um, um, but giving more context. Uh, Sorry. Um, we then, after we did these mid-level evaluations, we put together the, the mid-level evaluations. We got the larger scale ones and kind of a couple others. We picked up from friends and colleagues who were willing to share, and we did um, an analysis of, of what people were asking. It was actually, it turned out to be kind of an, an added benefit that people didn't find the protocol as useful because they, they ended up kind of doing a, a different array of things. And so we got a little bit more grist for, for analysis in terms of what people were thinking about how to, how to address these problems. So we did that analysis. Basically, we, we asked questions about what, um, what questions people were asking, what methods they were using to answer those questions, what conclusions they were drawing. And we compared that information to a four part part framework that I have up here, which was developed through a review of the literature on climate, the use of climate information for decision making, with the concept that kind of those four things are each more or less axes on which climate services um, 
kind of the relative, they help to determine the relative success of climate services. So I don't, it's a little bit unwieldy for me to kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of that analysis kind of in the time I have, but I can say as a general overview, we found that, I think this is kind of in response to what Ed said earlier, um, previously no one had looked at the kind of context and the, in which people were making decisions, and now most of our evaluations were focused on that, um, on looking at the users and understanding their needs and, and things like that. There was a lot less um, attention paid to the information, the, the climate information in our evaluations. I, I'm sure in part of this, part of this is because uh, kind of in the scientific realm there are already well-established metrics for, um, for the, to describe the quality of, of climate information. Um, but it was, it was not very many of our evaluations engaged with those metrics or talked about how to understand whether the information was properly tailored or disseminated. Um, very few of the evaluations also engaged with this concept of governance. A lot of them included kind of a list of the organizations that were involved and maybe talked about the strengths and weaknesses of those organizations, but far fewer um, addressed issues that were, for instance, um, sorry, the sustainability of the service or did the service have um, established monitoring and evaluation protocols. Th those kind of issues weren't addressed. So, so that was another kind of gap. Um, I guess there's a little bit more there, but bef before I run out of time, I, I wanted to bring up um, a few themes that we pulled out from that analysis that kind of are some overarching lessons on where we want to move forward with climate service evaluation. Um, one of the things is, that we, we focused on was that the evaluations really need to focus on learning. Um, at, at this point, a lot of evaluations ask questions, for instance, like, are we doing the right things to get, or are we doing things right, excuse me, are we doing things right to get to our stated goal, which is very useful in understanding did this, did this um, evaluation make an impact and things like that. But we also need to be open in this kind of new and emerging field to other kinds of learning. We need to make sure we're asking questions. Are we doing the right things? Is this, is this you know, a worthy goal? And also, how are we deciding what the right things are? I think all of those questions should still be on the table. Um, I know it, it sounds a little bit abstract, I think, when I talk about this like this, but I, I think the, the paradigm shift from supply-driven to demand-driven services that has taken place in this field in the last, I don't know, 10 or so years, um, is an example of this, what we would call triple loop learning, and I think we really need to foster that kind of learning moving forward. Um, another issue here is that we have to make sure we're asking the right questions. Uh, of course, our, what we're learning is predicated by the sorts of questions we ask. Um, and one way to determine, to, to make sure we're asking the right questions is to ask questions that people really want to know the answer to um, and are not, necess not just academic or interesting. Um, but we should be careful when, when we do this that we take into account the fact that climate services are these inherently networked, um, networked services, networked activities that I think a lot of the speakers this morning have talked about. And, and so the people who want answers might not just be the, the people at the top or the funders, but kind of all the way along those chains, there are interesting questions that we should explore. Um, I think... Oh, as an add-on here, I, I just want to make sure, I want to add that we're, we're also going to need to start interrogating um, our understandings of investments in climate services, not just by comparing climate services to, say, the absence of that service, but also to the poss other possible interventions that we may have made in order to achieve our goals. Um, and I really haven't seen any of that in the literature, so I think that would be interesting. Um, another point uh, is to improve monitoring and evaluation kind of across the board. Most of the evaluators that, that we sent out weren't able to access any information from the services that they, they engaged with um, in terms of just were the, was the service meeting its goals, was it producing the information it said, like that. Um, so, so kind of that basic information is really important. We need to build that in from the beginning. Um, as an add-on here, I think we also need to start thinking about quality assurance. Um, because we're asking kind of a, a wide array of different kinds of organizations to collect information that we can use to understand the utility of these services, and some of them might not have the, that capacity built in. So, so in order to ensure that we can kind of get a broad picture of this, we're going to need to think about maybe standardizing questions or, or focusing on issues like that. Um, a final point here, which is maybe kind of the most unexpected 
at least for me, was that we should start thinking about using evaluations as a way to explicate our own values. Um, naturally, evaluation has to do with assigning value and making judgments, um, and so values is, uh, is rolled into this. But in climate services, we have seen kind of up until, well, I think in climate services, our values are often implicit or kind of ill-defined. But, but these kind of tools and the, the triple loop learning that I mentioned before can help us to understand how our judgments about equity or expertise, what counts as expertise or sustainability, shape or not, or don't shape the services that we're investing in. Um, and I think understanding that will really help us to, to better achieve our goals. So um, I think I'm, I'm probably just at the end of my time, so I'm gonna close. Um, I know that I did cover quite a bit of ground, so I'm, I'm sorry if I've preferenced kind of breadth over depth. I'm happy to talk about more details at the break if anyone's interested. Um, and I guess I wanted to make one final point that I think working collaboratively on this concept of climate service evaluation is very important because we, we're gonna need to meet these increasing demands for information about what's working and what's not, and we're gonna need to make information that's relevant to all the various kind of very diverse stakeholders that are involved in this. So, Participating in this activity through the Climate Services Partnership, I think, was really like a, a pleasure for us, and um, we'll certainly look forward to, to continuing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So the last speaker of the session is Glenn Anderson, who's going to put some numbers to this evaluation. <laughs> Okay, so which one works? This one? Really? Ah, uh, right arrow. It says. Um, good morning, almost uh, lunchtime. I, I'm going to talk about economic valuation of climate services. And one thing I want to make clear is that this isn't a separate topic from the previous ones. And I'll give you an illustration of how important understanding behavior is to being able to uh, estimate the values of climate services. And some of the, a lot of this, and also I want to thank Walter for stealing about half of my thunder, um, <laughs> which it is not a problem. Um, but Walter covered some really important aspects and talked about users, and I want to focus quite a bit on that. Um, as we all know, climate services have just mushroomed. Um, the research has helped develop a lot more services in terms of the type, the coverage, and the quality of those services. And we also, as everybody in this room knows, uh, we have much better mechanisms for delivering those services and for receiving that information. It's called a cell phone, um, among other things. Um, <clears throat> I got interested in this because I'm a development economist. I'm mainly interested in getting things out to the developing countries. And it seemed to me there were sort of three elements that were important. Uh, sharing international um, knowledge and experiences, making sure we're giving people good quality services from a technical and institutional perspective. And I would also say giving them a service that they can use as opposed to a service that we think is good. And this is really an important issue, and I'll talk about that later. And then assessing the economic and social value of climate services. And I'm going to mainly focus on the latter, the latter issue. Um, really briefly, climate services can focus on things to deal with variability and extremes and hazards, uh, weather forecasts, uh, seasonal and monthly forecasts, decision support tools. But they're also, as we know, useful for um, information and analysis, the research, people working on dissertations, people doing forecasting doing longer term projections than that. Unfortunately, at this point, we're just starting to scratch the surface on the value of climate services for the first set of issues, not the second. And I've queried people about, oh, you just did an adaptation strategy. What was the value of climate services? Did you make better decisions because of that? And they said, I hope so. Um, globally, the cost of providing services exceeds 10 million. This was a number from about 2005. I think it's closer to 12 billion now. And one of the things that's interesting is that um, the studies that have been done 
whether they're done at a, a MET service level, if they focus on a single product, and even if they focus on individual user communities, the benefits to cost ratios are always really quite good. And if you think about this in comparison to a lot of other public investments, this is good news. However, um, MET services, and particularly in developing countries, and probably even in the United States, have a lot of trouble getting the budgets they need, either to maintain or improve or expand the coverage of their services. And this is particularly true in developing countries. And so one of the reasons to focus on valuing MET services is to justify the services vis-a-vis -vis other public expenditures. If you want to develop a new service, what, how is that going to benefit um, the public? to deal with gaps in maintenance and depreciation of equipment, and to demonstrate you know, that these services are useful to transportation, to agriculture, to different strategic sectors in the economy. Um, a little bit of background. Um, Steve mentioned that we formed a working group 2011 after the first um, International Conference on Climate Services. And we began compiling a list of studies that had been done. And we developed about a, 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 a literature review of about 140 studies. Of those 140 studies, only 50 of them had been done in developing countries. Uh, most of them had been done in the United States, Australia, uh, and Europe. And we forged a partnership between the Climate Services Partnership uh, with USAID support, the World Meteorological Organization, the World Bank, to develop a book or a primer on designing economic studies. And the book is almost done. This is what it looks like, and it's um, in this form. The WMO is going to be publishing it in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and Russian, I believe. And they're mad at me because it's going to cost them a couple hundred thousand dollars to uh, publish the book. Um, it's divided into 10 chapters, includes five uh, technical appendices. And I want to mention that one of the appendices is a pretty good summary of 10 different case studies, valuation studies. And, and I think it um, was written by Janet Clements from Stratus App. And she did a really, really nice job on that. Um, the types of economic analyses that we talk about are what are called whole of services analysis, where you look at the total value of a MET service. Ex ante analysis, where you're thinking about either a new service or an expanded coverage of that service or other types of improvements. And ex post analysis, we've had this service, are we getting something out of it? Do we need to keep it? And essentially, if we had added even more money to add study, we could have looked at the economic value of the Molly Met service, and that would have been the third <laughs> component. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, Walter talked about is a bit about value chains, and he used the, med exa the uh, medical example. But the book is structured around thinking about value chains and looking at the production and delivery of services, which is the chain in the middle contributions of, of research and data management. But all this gets you is this gets the service out the door. And at that point, you don't have any value. You, and so the kinds of assessments you can do, you can look at the institutional delivery of those services. You can look at some of the technical aspects. What you need to do is take the value chain and link it, link it to users. And in terms of the value chain, I don't have a pointer, I don't think. Oh, this one? Yes. Okay. Watch your eyes. Okay. The basic services is that from the previous is that box there. And then this is sort of specialized services. Oops, I can't do that, can I? Uh, specialized services. And then what happens with those services is decision makers get this information. They process the information, translate it, as Walter said. They make decisions, and out of those decisions come outcomes. Until you have outcomes, you can't even begin to really measure benefits. 
Normally with value chains, you can look at the benefits added for each stage. But with climate services, you have to get the product out and people have to translate it, interpret it before you begin to see any value. I think there's a whole bunch of points I want to make here. Just a second, bear with me. Now, one of the things that's interesting about decision making, and this is where what, what Sheila presented is really important because economists, we're, we, don't, we sort of take, make a lot of assumptions and one of them is about behavior. And some of the studies that have been done in agriculture assume a perfect forecast and they assume a perfect response to forecast. But I just want to share with you the challenges we face in trying to understand value. Uncertainty in the information. A lot of it is probabilistic. Attitudes toward risk of the people that might be using that information. Understanding of the information. Is it in a form that that particular user can make sense of? Um, capacity to take profit maximizing decisions. Do you have the ability to act on a good forecast or to minimize your losses in a, in a poor forecast? Strategic behavior. And I'll, at my very end, I'm going to come back to the strategic behavior issue. Do people engage in strategic behavior based on the information that they receive? And I'll give you an example right at the end. Trust. Do they trust the forecast or the information? And related to that is how long does it take to, for the diffusion of that new innovation to occur? Is it something where you just announce, we have a new forecast, congratulations, start using it? Well, farmers don't do that. It takes time for them to trust it, and they look to see if other people are using it, and you expect there'll be a real lag in the diffusion of the innovation. Um, I stole the slide. Uh, there's a professor at University of Illinois that teaches the only applied MET course that I know of, and his name is, his name is uh, Bob Rauber, and these are some of his slides, but one thing is there's a lot of user communities that you can focus on in thinking of, in terms of these benefits. The way the book is structured is around uh, developing, um, implementing a, a, a socioeconomic benefit study. We encourage people to develop concept notes, do scopes of work, commission the study, conduct the study. And that last box is really important, communicating the results of the, the study. And we have an entire chapter in the book on that. The steps in designing a benefit cost, and this is essentially the structure we follow in the book. And you know, the important things are you know, understanding what is it that you're trying to evaluate? What is the baseline for before and after? If you're looking at whole service, unfortunately the before is having the service and the after is not having the service, but maybe getting the information from other places. So it's a very tricky kind of evaluation that gets done. And the book goes through all of these steps and the last one there is to communicate the, the results of that study. Oops. Um, about three weeks ago, we did our first training using the book uh, in Antigua for um, 14 countries, um, met services from the Caribbean and one from Honduras. And we plan to do a couple of additional ones and we really focus the book on trying to help MEP services, you know, understand how these benefit studies can help them, get the resources to do it, and then hire people like me and other economists to do the studies for them. Um, and um, until you start having studies in, in the developing country, uh, it's going to be very hard for, to take results from the United States and translate them. And so one of the things we're pushing for is to get the first study ever done in the Caribbean, for example. That's one of the regions that's missing. And in the, in the workshops, the participants develop a concept note. And we actually had them present their proposals for studies to a group of trainers, which was renamed the Ministry of Finance. And we had each group sort of make a presentation. Um, and that was quite interesting. Um, some of the next steps. Um, trying to figure out how to sustain the training program that at this point is being implemented by the Climate Services Partnership with USAID funding and WMO. We're trying to identify champions and nurture them in regions. There's a young woman that's just joined CIMH, who's the first social scientist they've hired, 
and she's interested in trying to carry the torch and help you know, build up an understanding of these issues in the Caribbean. We need to continue to build the case for climate services. There's a lot of gaps in the developing world. We need more studies, um, areas such as the Caribbean. Asia actually has very few studies. Uh, there's a few more in Africa, mostly focused on agriculture, and then mostly other developed countries. And continue to update the literature. There's an event that's being planned for 2017, which is Madrid plus 10. In 2007, Madrid um, hosted a workshop to talk about the benefits of uh, climate services. There was a work program that went with that, and one of the tasks was to write a book. So we finally did that, even though we weren't part of that discussion originally. I want to, how much time do I have? Oh, good. Um, the, th the one that's not on here, and I want to stress, is we need to do more research. And in particular, we need a better understanding of decision making and how people make decisions. And we have to really understand behavior better. That's not something economists do, uh, as well as other types of social scientists. But it's really important. Why do people stay home in hurricanes? Why do they stay home in typhoons? Why did a, a very large population not evacuate uh, in Philippines a few years ago, resulting in over 1,100 deaths, partly because they'd never had a typhoon uh, in, uh, in the south of Philippines. So I want to just give you one of the interesting, this is a real example from Kazakhstan. And in 2013, um, every year they have what they call a field day. And they talk to the farmers about when to plant their wheat crop. And in 2013, the field day was held beginning of April. And they, they told the farmers they should plant around May 25th in the region. And so we, working with UNDP, did a set of field studies at a research station. And we planted wheat May 5th, May 15th, May 25th, and June 5th, four different times. And then in August that year, we did a, a, a field, field day, and I was there, and we got to see how the wheat was doing. And the wheat was about this high on May 25th, about this high if it was planted June 5th. It was about this high if it had been planted on May 5th and somewhere in between. The estimated yields, if, they, if people had planted on the day that was proposed, was about two to three um, tons per hectare. If you planted it earlier, you were going to get less than one ton per hectare a week. So the next day, we, we drove from Kostanai to Pe Petropavlovsk, and every single field was that high. Everybody had planted on May 5th. They had planted as soon as they could. And you sort of say, well, wait a second. Do people not trust the, the forecast and the recommendation? Yeah, there's some of that going on. But what was really interesting is the previous year had been way below average in terms of yields, and the grain elevators were empty. So a lot of farmers were planting early in hopes that they could get a good price for their grain if they could get it to the elevators a lot earlier. Because late season, two, two or three years before, they'd had so much wheat produced that they ran out of elevator space. And farmers took a bath because they had to put the grain on the ground. And it got graded afterwards. So understanding, you know, just having a better forecast or better information doesn't guarantee that people will make the decisions that you think. They do engage in strategic behavior. And I think that I think we need to really focus not only on the economics, but on a lot of the behavioral science research as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Until 12? Yeah, so, so we have about uh, 20 minutes for discussion, and then I forgot to mention that Jim Beiser here from the University of Arizona will be the rapporteur for this whole session. And at 12 o'clock, uh, Jim will present his report. So 
we have lots of questions, I suspect. Let's start here and then there. Uh, what changes have occurred in Mali and India and Senegal in how the uh, med services are operating following the re results of the evaluations? That's actually an easier question to answer than you'd think because the evaluation isn't done. Um, although I will point out that Glenn's book has taken at least as long as our evaluation. Uh, and it costs as much. We are, are to, to clarify what we have done and what we're still working on, what we finished and what Sheila was reporting on that is completed is we do understand the patterns of use. By the way, this was done in southern Mali. This did not speak to anything happening in northern Mali right now. Um, we are in the middle of digging through 200 qualitative interviews um, and participant uh, observation data from this past summer that uh, our lab and field teams were gathering. Um, so we're sifting through that now. So some of the um, things that Sheila talked about are some of our very initial uh, findings behaviorally, but uh, if Peter Schultz was looking over my shoulder, I was panic coding gender data actually in the first session because we're a little behind on this. Um, so we're working on that now. The, I will say this, we are working very closely with the Met Service in Mali there. They are fully aware of everything we're doing. We've kept them updated all the way through. And they are actually pretty enthusiastic about this because they've come around to understand that this is not an evaluation that's aimed at punishing them for doing a good job or not good job at all. This is an opportunity for them to identify gaps that then donors and others can step into to help them fill. So I, I have a good sense as of now that this will be taken up and worked with, um, but we don't have anything concrete yet. Thank you. Thanks. Randy Freed with ICF. Um, it seems like the, uh, the basic question that all of our speakers have been trying to answer is how effective are climate services? And given that Servier has been around for, I think Jenny said, nine years or so now, it seems like there's a fairly long track record. But most of the climate services that have been provided have been provided on a much shorter time scale. It strikes me that it's not that surprising that the answer that everybody has come up with is it's really hard to tell how effective the services are because it, it also kind of strikes me that four things need to happen to make the case that the services are valuable. You need to have a situation where something unusual happens. You need to have a situation where you predicted that accurately. You need to have a situation where somebody acted based on your prediction and you need to have a situation where, based on their action, they got a superior outcome. So the question I would pose is, how often do we have all four of those things happening? And do we have any situations where that's happened twice in the same place? Because it kind of strikes me that uh, once people see the proof of the pudding, that's really where you're going to get widespread adoption. That's where you're going to have a lot of demand for the climate services. Thanks. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, comment. I, I would add to that comment, when I was listening to the speakers, are we talking here about evaluating climate services with the four components, or are we mainly evaluating one of those components, which is the use? And that's a question we need to think, yeah, because that's the reason why I opened my presentation with a definition, is that I see that more and more often people translate climate services into some uptake or use of some climate information tool. And it's a whole process with four, at least four uh, pillars. The, the, other, the other question I would like to ask the panel is, oh, I have so many questions, but I'll choose a couple. Uh, in, in our experience, again, 20 years working, in, we changed the names. You know, now we call it climate services. We used to call it climate risk management. But basically, the IRI has 20 years working in this type of, of uh, area. And one of the lessons that we learned is that the success of an activity, it doesn't matter if it is what it is, the success of an activity interacting with society very often depends on having the right person in the right place at the right time. So 
if you are lucky enough to find a Minister of Agriculture who is open to incorporating new tools and, and things like that, then you have great stories. And, and you think that you had it solved. You think that you have the right process established, the right products. The right and then the administration changes and the new minister has a completely different view. And sometimes the whole thing falls back to zero. And so, you know, one, one of the things I would love to be able to advance is what do we need to do to shield from those ups and downs? So the two points that I would like to leave uh, to stimulate more discussions are, one, when we say that we, we are evaluating climate services, are we actually evaluating the services or only one part of that? And two, how do we shield from the circumstantial conditions that can create a great story, a very good evaluation, I mean, not a, a very successful case from a not successful case, depending just on one person, maybe, or an institution? Um, I have a, a success story. Um, when we were in Uruguay for the ICCS4, the World Food Program told us about a, a product that had been developed for pastoralists in Ethiopia. And it was using NVDI, looking at the vegetation indica indicator. And what the pastoralists were using this for was to figure out where to move their herds towards um, forage. And during the season, they would get this NVDI and they would make decisions on which directions to take the herds. And at the end of the season, they were able to estimate that they had had a 49% reduction in mortality of animals by not going to the wrong place. And they knew exactly what the value of those livestock, um, the reduction in morbidity was. And it turned out that for a very small investment, they had about $6 million in, in benefits just from that. So sometimes there's little nuggets like that that you can get. But, but you're, you're right, and the real problem is that someone acted, and they had the capability. Um, in Kazakhstan, we asked the farmers, if you get a good forecast, what do you do? I grow wheat. If I get a bad forecast, what do I do? I grow wheat. If I get an or a normal forecast, what do I do? I grow wheat. Uh, can I conclude that you grow wheat? Yes. Um, but <laughs> the better farmers are growing sunflower, and they're growing linseed and rapeseed, and they're they're interspersing legumes, and they're growing other cereals, and they're taking advantage of a very large gene pool or seed pool of drought-resistant things. So the, how, getting people to act takes a lot of things. It takes a good, in agriculture, it takes a good ag extension service, access to capital, um, appropriate crop insurance, and a number of these other things uh, to be able to do that. Kathy, and then Ed. Um, sure, I, I just want to speak quickly to a few of the questions that Walter asked. Um, I think in terms of are we evaluating uh, services, the whole chain, or are we evaluating just use, I think we need to look at both of the side. We, we need to be doing all of that. Um, you know, if we're talking about kind of a, a standard impact evaluation, the question is, did we do what we said we did, did you know, and, and what was the outcome of that? And that is an interesting question, but because there is so much to learn all along the chain, I think we... We can't just focus on one kind of evaluation. We need to be thinking all along um, the chain in order to understand and document what does work, which, which is still, this is a, still an intense learning process. Um, and I think kind of this is related to your other question about how do we uh, kind of identify the contexts that are conducive to supporting con climate services and, and to not have this instance in which you thought you had it figured out and that person leaves and you've, you've, it all fell apart in front of you. Um, and I think that we need to be more creative about thinking about what sorts of tools help us to understand those contexts. And we, I think we've talked a little bit about this before that, you know, sort of this is what kind of the network analysis um, studies that are coming on have to do with identifying where there are redundancies or where there might be kind of really critical parts that we want to build more capacity in. How do we think about the sorts of governance structures and institutional arrangements that support these services moving forward? There is really 
almost no literature on that. And so I think this is kind of a wide open field for us to get involved in. So I think I'm going to be able to speak to a, a lot of these. Um, Randy, to your point, I, I like the four points, but I actually don't think you need something unusual to happen. I'd say if there's anything that uh, we're doing in our lab, it's actually working on what Glenn was talking about. We're working really hard on understanding people's decision making. And if you understand people's decision making, you don't need an unusual event to see how they are or aren't using the information. But you have to have a really high resolution on that decision making. And so we spend a lot of time hanging out on the ground with people, parsing out what they're doing. And to give you just two extraordinarily quick examples of stuff that Glenn was talking about that can con confound things when you start thinking about valuation or thinking about people's uh, understandings. Work we did under CCRD with the Red Cross uh, in Zambia. One of the things that the Zambian Red Cross was concerned about that was that in an area where there's a lot of well, there's seasonal flooding, but every once in a while they get very serious floods, um, they were really concerned that a chunk of the population simply would not move, no matter when they were told to move or anything else. And there was a lot of assumptions that the population had not been adequately sensitized or educated or anything else. We got there and dug in and we figured out that that was absolutely not the case. That the people who weren't moving were the wealthiest people in the community and the most educated, but they're the ones who own cattle. And the early warning to move was only coming about a day to two days before the flood hit, which was not enough time for them to move their cattle to new pasture land. And that meant if they left, their cattle were going to die. So this wasn't just an economic decision. Owning cattle was huge to this one subset, really, of men. Their identity, because of course they also were the ones who lent out this cattle to everyone else in the community to plow with. So not only would you lose your economic benefits, you're going to lose your social status, you're going to lose everything. These guys would rather stay with their cows and risk death. And that was actually an incredibly logical decision within their framework that the Red Cross had never thought about and needed to engage with. So we didn't even need to see the big flood coming up to figure out ways in which longer term, earlier warning, as it turns out, two to three weeks, they love that idea. Because that'll get, let them get the cattle out of the way. So we can actually start to work on some of that. Also, we saw in Senegal, this speaks to some examples people came up, um, we saw very, very wealthy people ignoring uh, advisories on seasons and planting short cycle peanuts because they're trying to time the hungry season. They have Chinese buyers all lined up who actually control a lot of the transport stuff that's going on inside Senegal. And the guy said, I don't care. My peanuts will come in. We said, what happens if your peanuts fail because you planted too soon? He says, I've got money for more seeds. He's going to gamble. Every once in a while, he'll lose. But he's got <laughs> plenty of money to kind of take care of that. Um, so uh, we're digging really hard on those behavioral kinds of decisions so that we don't have to have all four of those things. We don't need to see it happen over and over. We can actually look at what people are doing now and think about how that information fits. And just very, very quickly, the larger Mali assessment actually did integrate. We worked closely with IRI to bring in an evaluation of the climate science into that. There's a whole set of recommendations on the climate science side in the initial report. We also tried to do an institutional assessment. And while that is easily the weakest part of the report, and I wish that we had more time to go back and really work on that, um, it did speak to the structures that were in place in Mali and the conditions under which that service came together and organizations were able to work together. Uh, in that particular case, it, they were definitely uh, practitioners of Rahm Emanuel saying about never wasting a good crisis. Um, they, because of the serious crisis in the late 70s and early 80s, they were able to drag everybody into a room through many different groups within the Malian government and get them to act non-hierarchically because they basically were in a blind panic at that point. And they were able to set up an organization that actually worked because of it. But that's kind of a unique situation. It's not clear how that would translate to other places, but it's something we did learn. Great. Uh, can you say something about champions real quickly? OK. We have two questions, and I want to be sure that we hear from the audience. So please be very brief. Um, Champions is also a particular issue, and, and one of the things is, is do people look at the information that's provided, or do they look at how other people respond to it? And, you know, we have, like, dominant firm models in economics and other things, but we did, uh, we did a stakeholder workshop. Charlotte uh, was there along with Deborah and Tepley and myself, and we had one farmer in Petropavlos that basically said, well, if the, if the forecast is any good, we'll use it. And at the time, I didn't know who this person was. It turned out that every year he organized, he's a very big corporate farmer, he organizes his own field day and he invites all the farmers from the area to come in and see all of his experiments with legumes and oil seeds, different kind of cultivation practices and that. So it wasn't the ag extension people that had the trust, it was a commercial farmer. 
And you know, when, you when you're designing things, you have to know about these kind of relationships and the way that people relate to others. Uh, it's not always a simple thing that, oh, well, there's the ag extension, they're the, the experts. You have to really understand the dynamics in a community. Thank you. So, yes, there, and then Alex. The one in the back, too. Oh. Thank you. Um, Gene Brantley with RTI. Um, I just wanted to, most of the discussion so far um, has dealt with rainfall predictions and temperature prediction forecasts and um, their application, I think, primarily to rain-fed agriculture. And I just want to uh, bring up two other examples um, where this kind of information is really critical for the management of reservoirs and stored water, which is a huge buffer against um, variability in, in rainfall. Uh, I was recently in Mexico where uh, I was also uh, in an area where there were wheat farmers. And the you know, personal identity of these farmers was really tied up in their ability to grow winter wheat. And even though the Met Service had provided accurate information on rainfall, the irrigation district and its interaction with the National Water Commission had run the reservoir down to zero by not adapting its, its distributions, its water releases, um, over a three to five year period. And it was really tied up in the decision making structure between these various institutions and the, um, the structure of government financed crop insurance and how cropping decisions were made. And so you really had to dig deeply into the decision making structure of the several institutions in order to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, so I commend uh, your, your results, all of which I think um, uh, speak to a truism I like to say, that everyone behaves, behaves rationally. It just depends on their circumstances. Thank you. Uh, Alex, and then I, I also, I think we have a question from the internet. So Alex, and then the internet. Yeah, I am Alex Guerra from the Climate Change Research Institute in, in Guatemala. Um, I am assuming you were all talking about national climate services, uh, but I, uh, I mean in some cases uh, you mentioned regional ones, which are uh, great. Um, but I'm also wondering whether this demand-driven um, tendency is also, as I've seen at least in my country, uh, there are lots of investments, uh, private investments in, in climate uh, services. And so I'm wondering whether there is a new role to play by the national services in sort of coordinating and making sure that the data generation is uh, properly done or assessing the, the tools that they have at the national level or whether they should focus on specific groups in the country, for example, the subsistence farmers, for example. So, um, yeah, so I'm wondering whether what, what trends you've seen globally and what uh, your thoughts are on this uh, maybe new role of the national services. So, I'm going to take this one very shortly. And, and I think your question, Alex, again, emphasizes the need to have a common definition of what we're talking about climate services. Because I think you're referring to MET services, right? You're talking to the MET institutions. And, and I think it's very good that you just mentioned this, because I believe that that's a concept that a lot of people, you know, they, they, they use the equation climate service equal MET service. And, and it's a very unfortunate name that they are so similar. But we're talking about different things. The med service is one of many, many boxes in these complicated networks that we were showing to provide the climate services. So, uh, you know, that, it's something that I think is very important. Of course, the, the, the answer is the, 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 the role of the med services is critical. If, if you don't have even the data, the information, then there's nothing to work with. But I think it's important that we keep reminding ourselves that we're talking about climate services and not the MET and hydrology institutions. Now, I want to give the chance to, for the people in the online. Thank you. This question comes from Lori Ashley. She is, uh, she's here in DC, NRM specialist, independent, independent consultant, pardon me. Mm -hmm. This is going to uh, Walter. Uh, 
back to your point about evaluating the full climate services chain. She says, you point out that the high, the, the high level of uncertainty, what types of climate services information has the best ability to be actionable? What is the highest quality of information that climate services can generate, and where can we aim to improve that information? Yeah, again, I think that, that question also for, to me is, it's great to, to discuss a more general concept. I mean, answering that question is impossible, right? Because what, what are we talking about? But the way that question is framed, I think is interesting. Because the, the way that the question is framed is what, let's say, what climate information, what climate tool, what climate product is the best? And that's the most common mistake that we all make when we try to develop uh, work in this area. The, the question is not what can we offer you. The question is what problems are you facing that are related to climate? And then what type of product can we develop, hopefully together, that will help you to work in those problems? But the question is not supply. It's, you know, I have all these great toys for you. Wh which one is best for you? That's not. The problem is, the, the, I think it's healthier to ask, what are the most important problems related to your development plans that are related uh, to climate? And, that, and given that problem, what uh, kind of products or what climate services do we need to establish? You want to? Oh, OK. There's one more question, it's going to, sorry, but it's going to be the last one. It's in the back there. It's two. It's two. Thanks, I'm sorry. I'm going to sneak in two questions, I think. Um, I wanted to follow up on Kathy. You made a reference to other forms, be, opening, be open to other forms of learning. Would you sort of unpackage that a little bit, be a little more explicit? And my second question is, the forecasts that have been presented as examples of a good forecast, for example, um, for me, is that because of the nature of the time of the presentation that you have, or are these forecasts consistently good? What's, there's no reference to consistency. Thank you. Um, so in terms of learning, I mean, we all are learning all kinds of things all the time, and so we don't need to put kind of our learning into different boxes. But in, in the case of evaluation, we're structuring processes to help us learn certain things. And so kind of in the jargon of that field, they have different ways to talk about this. And so if you, if you are asking questions like, did did we do things the way we said we would do them? And did that turn out the way we said it would? You know, you're basically checking um, up on the project and what was the impact of the project. Uh, then that's, that's what they call sing single loop learning. You're just going to get an answer, yes or no. Should we keep doing this, yes or no? Um, <laughs> die, die. Wow. <laughs> Never miss a text again. Um, um, Better than me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, but we also need to, because this is kind of a, a, a really emerging field, we need to be, it, we, we need to not just ask questions like that. Did we do the right thing? Did we do the things right? We need to say, is this worth doing? You know, um, in what context is it worth doing? And how are we deciding? What kind of processes are we using to decide what is worth doing? Um, kind of the history of this field involves a lot of climate scientists saying, look, I have this really cool information. Surely it's useful. And the field evolved really pretty far that way, but then it evolved a lot faster or in a different way when the question was what Walter has just posed, I have this problem, how can you help me to solve it? And so that was a different kind of a, a way to learn differently. And so I just, I think we need to kind of make sure that the structures that we're creating to learn about the process are open to all of those different kinds. Let me, we have one minute. I mean, we are minus one minute, but, on the question on consistency, what is a good forecast? Again, that's a, a great question to remind us 
that climate services has all these different components. And one is a production of information, right? Well, in, in the climate community, there are a lot of very objective and rigorous and robust uh, indices to measure how good a forecast is. And, and this, it, they evaluate different things. They evaluate accuracy. They evaluate things like consistency. They, and so, but the important thing of what you just asked is that if we are thinking of climate services, that has to be included as part of the, of the work. Is, uh, there is a component that has to do with starting with a problem. And there is a component that is just plain scientific work. Is how do you evaluate objectively forecasts? For example, I'm using this example because it's what you asked. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'm going to pass the microphone to John. So while our panelists are stepping down, um, I wanted to say a few words about this. Um, I read Glenn's book, and it was really good. It was not a thriller, um, it's, but it was really clearly written. It was very educational. It was, I highly recommend it, maybe not in one sitting. But uh, it, was, it was really good, and I think it's going to become kind of a, a useful standard thing that gets used. The annexes cover what is a climate, what is a weather service, what is a, a hydro service. Um, there's a little bit of history. There are the case studies, and then there's the step-by-step. -step. If you want to buy, evaluate, or evaluation services, essentially it teaches you how to write a scope of work. I also wanted to, given some of uh, Sheila's and Glenn's examples um, about uh, you know, I think Sheila said women can't plant until the men are done with the tools. Glenn said that uh, people may plant on May 5th, or May, yeah, May 5th, regardless of what you tell them. Um, on day one, there was a question from South Africa from the internet about non-climate stresses, and I think those are great examples. You can give people perfect information. There, there may be some constraint that keeps them from acting on it the way that you might think they would. Um, not having the tools or having a history of either not trusting the forecast or not seeing the example from someone you trust are good examples of that. Um, now we're going to have Jim Beiser, who is the co-PI of the IRAP program. Jim has been our, uh, our rapporteur for the day, and he's going to give us 10 or 15 minutes of reflections on what we heard. Then we'll have lunch, and then we'll come back. Lawrence Bouja from NCAR will give us Kind of a readout okay. um, on uh, reflections on the whole week. And then after Lawrence, we'll begin the, uh, the session on kind of new directions or next directions for USAID. Um, I hope everyone can stay for all of it. And over to Jim. Thanks, John. So uh, I knew this was going to be challenging to do in real time, um, but it was even more so than I had imagined. Um, as, uh, as John said, uh, uh, I'm going to give you about 15 minute summary. I'm coming from the University of Arizona, uh, where, among other things, I serve as co-PI with Lisa uh, Goddard on the project that she described. Um, and before I even start, I'm going to apologize to the presenters. Um, we um, had some awesome, wonderful, fantastic, what, what else was I supposed to say, Ed? Um, <laughs> revolutionary, brilliant uh, presentations, presenters and presentations. Um, eh, eh, and I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna try and summarize uh, all of that in uh, just a very, very brief time. First, so I'm gonna apologize to them because I'm sure that, uh, that, uh, that what I've heard and my attempt to summarize people's life work in this uh, very short time isn't gonna be quite the same. Uh, but it's really mainly to remind you what you heard and see if you can sort of put it all uh, together in your minds um, in preparation for Lawrence's summary. And uh, so um, we, we started with Walter. Walter talked to us a bit about um, ad adapt adaptation, and there are different types of adaptation, including uh, these poor dogs. There's only one tree left um, due to de <laughs> deforestation. Uh, uh, and... Um, 
But he, uh, he gave us a fabulous example. I love using the uh, medical examples as well. Um, he told us that we ought to be flexible. Um, uh, he gave us a spaghetti diagram. This one's a little bit more simple than the, the, the climate service spaghetti diagram that you gave us, Walter. And then uh, he talked to us about um, being able to communicate uncertainty. Uh, Steve uh, uh, went over the, the uh, sorry, the, um, well, Steve told us that the climate, that it reminded us that climate is central to the development challenge. He talked to us about the climate services partnership, went through the various activities that, uh, that uh, the partnership has, um, and, then, uh, and then challenged us to be thinking about looking ahead, what we might be doing with this effort, what we might be doing uh, as far as uh, uh, the, the further development of, uh, I'm not sure if you use the phrase community of practice, but certainly it would be a community of practice. Uh, then we had, um, <laughs> then we had <laughs> an amazing presentation, a fantastic presentation from uh, about Jamaica, um, and uh, the um, talking about climate services in Jamaica and uh, building awareness, farmers bulletin, web portal. It was pretty amazing, actually, uh, the, the amount of work and what you've done so far. Uh, stakeholder consultations, uh, production of the SPI, the seasonal drought for forecast, and that as a new product, a new tool. Um, Lisa um, described the IRAP project, the International Research and Applications Project, uh, primarily funded by NOAA, but also by USAID, particularly this first year. Um, the title of that project is Integrating Climate Information and Decision Processes for Regional Climate Resilience. Uh, and. Uh, I'm just going to add one thing to what Lisa was saying, because she may have said this, but I was probably busy typing, that we start with a scoping. Um, when we go to a region, we take a look. It's not like we're going to be saying, oh, we're going to take care of everything that is happening in, in, say, the Caribbean. We start with a scoping to see what are the important questions. What is it that, that actually supports livelihood? Um, and in places like Jamaica, uh, especially uh, the Blue Mountain uh, coffee, um, co uh, coffee is really important. It's not, it's not just an agricultural thing, it's a livelihood thing for them. And coffee leaf rust um, it destroys about $350 million worth of coffee across the region uh, every year. And so our project that uh, Lisa began to describe is in fact after our scoping, we drilled down into something that was critically important and actually was defined not by us, but it was defined because people came to us and say, we have this coffee leaf, leaf rust problem. You think your team can help us? And that then ended up in this project that uh, hopefully in a year or two we'll have a lot more to say about. Um, she reminded us that it's all, it, we need to work across time scales. It's really about where, where the decision is, what the decisions are. They, they, uh, Tend, tend to be, um, decisions tend to be, uh, decision makers have decisions that they need to do at all time scales. And so she told us um, that, um, that we needed to move out of our own comfort zone and work with other disciplines. Um, we needed to work with other communities that, um, that are, maybe weren't quite comfortable with. She reminded us that evaluation is important. We had a whole session on evaluation, so we kept hearing some of the same themes. Uh, her main point was that you need to begin, you design the evaluation from the outset, right at the very beginning. And to add to that, you, you, the people who are being evaluated need to be part of the process too, so that they can learn to trust you. And I think, uh, I think Glenn made the, the point about uh, trust, and so did Ed. Um, uh, Jenny uh, talked to us about Severe, uh, it, um, it, it USAID NASA project, uh, bringing uh, satellite information products down to the end user. There's your cell phone, uh, Glenn, um, with the farmers. Um, so take the, and, and uh, she reminds us that we need to take the time needed to establish and sustain programs, that it requires resources, it requires thought, it requires partnerships, et cetera. Et cetera. So she gave us a progress to date of the pro uh, program. She also told us about the Bangl uh, in Bangladesh, um, the disaster with flooding. And um, <laughs> this wasn't a slide that she used, but it's one that I've tended to use. Or the disaster, you can see where, I don't know if you can see it from the back, but. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Ed, uh, the absolutely brilliant presentation that Ed, um, Ed gave, um, talk to us about um, the economic, uh, economic assessments of climate services. And, and I, I really do enjoy that, uh, hearing Ed's talk because he certainly reminds us that not all stakeholders are the same. Um, <laughs> and that we need to understand our end users. And in fact, Ed reminds us that even within a household, the needs are different. The, 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 the perspectives are different, different because the, uh, their roles are different. And he uh, emphasized that, that uh, what else did he emphasize? Um, on, uh, to ask the right questions. Um, and uh, that we really need, uh, there's new, his project provided new evidence for evaluation methods and new methods. So um, then uh, Sheila Navalia Onzere, um, eh, with a focus on agrometeorology, to talked to us about some lessons in Mali. It was uh, sort of a, a, a fo more focused presentation of some of the work that she and Ed had done together. Um, eh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, focus was on the program impact on agricultural outcomes. Some people refer to that as uh, theories of change. Uh, so how, what is the role of the, the, the program? What are the impacts so that one can actually track and, and, and show that your program actually is what, what contributed to the outcomes? And that climate service evaluation goes beyond surveys involves a wide range of methodologies, and that's critically important because I'll, because these are expensive, it, it's really tempting to focus on one method um, when actually you're not necessarily going to get a really thorough evaluation if you do. Uh, scoping and assessment must focus on a small subset of decisions and activities. That actually ties back, uh, she led to our project with uh, the coffee leaf rust. Uh, because that's really one decision or one set of decisions by one um, focused uh, user group. Now, we believe that, uh, sorry USAID, that this can be a pilot, but it's also actually um, a solving a problem, a real problem. So next time maybe it's not coffee, maybe it's corn or wheat, it's about a methodology. Um, and, but it is focused on one set of decisions by one set of decision makers. Um, and that a useful, uh, usefulness of climate services varies greatly on the roles of users, and that's back to Ed's point. Uh, let's see, Kathy, talk to us about the, uh, uh, what did you talk to us about? Um, uh, cl climate services partnership again. Um, and and, and complementing what Steve had, had started talking about as well. Um, because of the, all of the challenges that we heard uh, as far as how to do evaluations and do them well, but do them in a cost-effective way, they looked at a, at a, at a mid-level, I think you call it mid-level evaluation approach. Uh, you can read here, uh, they went through reviews, they, they looked at the different approaches, um, uh, different types of evaluation. Um, uh, uh, and I, I'm not going to go into that detail because I think I'm, I'm really counting on Lawrence um, picking up where everything that I missed or <laughs> during the questions. Um, and then uh, there was this econo, I mean, there was Glenn um, that, um, that talked to us about um, the context for value and climate services. I'm, I really am looking forward to reading your books, especially the cartoon version. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, the, um, uh, but he reminded us that climate service is, is innovating, is expanding, um, the, the, uh, um, that we need to be catalyzing the diffusion of climate services into developing countries. Um, it is about adaptation options and a whole different types of them. He listed, these are just a few of the ones that he list, listed. Talked about the book that is about to come out. out. Uh, I've described it there a little bit about the outline, what I could type that fast. Um, uh, and, um, the, what I missed, um, and I pulled this out of The Economist, uh, what I missed is probably because my thought was subject to delay. And I thank you. Oh, I'm going to leave you with uh, my, one of my favorite Yogi Berra th sayings. We should all remember that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And then in a